What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. Well yesterday, Nintendo posted their financial results from quarter one of the current fiscal year. And while Nintendo themselves were down from last year, the Switch itself continues to roll along. In fact, it's now hot on the heels of the PlayStation 4 and the Game Boy. We'll go over all that here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about a new feature that was spotted through a patent for the PlayStation 5 DualSense controller. And we'll also talk about that Pokemon Presents that aired yesterday as it gave us an interesting new look at those legendary Pokemon. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button. Helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're going to start today with a very random release from Capcom onto the Switch eShop. Seemingly out of nowhere, it's a Mega Man game, but it's not necessarily one that you would expect to see pop up. You can see this over on the eShop. This is Mega Man Battle and Fighters. It's two different games from the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Yeah, like I said, out of out of left field, I would say, from Capcom. But it includes Mega Man The Power Battle and Mega Man 2 The Power Fighters, currently going for $8 on the eShop. Now, there are a few caveats to this one, as the product contains only the Japanese version, trading functions have been disabled, and the manual that is included with it, which is kind of cool that the manual is there, it's from the Neo Geo Pocket Color Edition. So some of the button prompts probably won't match up to the Switch itself, but either way, it's at least good to see Capcom release something for Mega Man, even though it's some, like it's something no one was expecting. It feels like Capcom's kind of just forgotten about the Mega Man franchise. I know they do have the Battle Network collection coming out next year, but like still, it just it seems like the entire series is just on the back burner for Capcom. So when I see something like pop up like this, I'm like, hey. I'll take it, especially for $8 for a cartridge that usually goes for like $200 to $300 on eBay. Also, if you're someone who's been waiting for sales on some of these PlayStation 5 games that are usually priced at like $70, well, there is currently one ongoing at several different retailers, as well as Amazon. So you can just have it shipped straight to your door. And these are, of course, physical copies of the games. We can see this over on Amazon with Horizon Forbidden West on the PS5 down to $50. Remember, that's Marked down from 70, so technically that's like 30% off, but unlike the PS4, it's uh, it's $40 there. The Neo Collection at at $40, and that's, that's not bad. I mean, it's Neo 1 and 2, and those are some really good games put on the PS5. Spider-Man Miles Morales, that's the Ultimate Edition. That does come with the Spider-Man Remastered version. That at 50, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart there at 40. Gran Turismo 7 at $50. We also have Uncharted Legacy of Thieves Collection on the PS5 at $30. Ghost Tsushima Director's Cut at $50. We also have Sackboy there at $30. Demon Souls at $40. And Death Stranding Director's Cut at $40. Uh, certainly worth checking out, especially if you've been kind of holding out, hoping to see some sales. And nice benefit, these are also physical copies that you can add to your collection on your shelf. Oh, and we've heard off and on that there would be a new wrestling game for AEW. And it looks like we're going to see a lot more gameplay and information next week. But there was this tease trailer that was released from THQ Nordic as they will be publishing this game. That's All Elite Wrestling, AEW, Fight Forever. It's from Ukes, and a lot of the talk in different previews has been that it's going to be a bit more arcadey than what we have for something like the WWE 2K series, which is trying really hard to be more simulation based. This is going to skate closer to like the No Mercy setup, which, hey, I'm all for that. But it's coming to PC, PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, Xbox Series S, X, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch, which that system sorely needs a good wrestling game because we have WWE 2K18. They never attempted another one and they didn't really go back and try to fix that one at all. So I'm hoping AEW Fight Forever ends up being at least a fun wrestling game that doesn't uh, function like 2K18. So I'll be keeping an eye out for this, but we should see more info for this uh, next week when THQ Nordic has their own presentation on August 12th. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get to the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with Nintendo's financial report from first quarter of this fiscal year. That would be April, May, and June. Of course, they compared it to last year and didn't go over so well for Nintendo. However, basically all of the tech companies and entertainment companies are down from 
what was a, a fairly inflated year, most of us would say, uh, when everyone was inside looking for something to do and they came across things like uh, buying games uh, online or even just buying a system for the first time in years. But if we take a look over on Nintendo's IR page, we can see where the Switch is currently sitting. That at 111.08 million units, that's uh, actually up 3.43 in this latest report. Now, compared to last year's Q1, hardware sales are down 23%. The Switch Lite took the biggest hit. That's down 48%. But I do kind of see the Switch Lite as the least desirable out of all of them. I know there's like the red box switch, the OLED, and then the switch light, which is what they're tracking. But to me, if you're gonna buy a switch for the first time, you're probably buying one that actually switches with the red box or the OLED system. The switch light's kind of like that secondary system or maybe one you would get for a younger kid. You don't want them to take up the TV. As for Nintendo's net sales, they were down 4%. Operating profit was down 15.1%, but Interestingly enough, their ordinary profit was actually up like 25%. So again, it wasn't as bad as I was expecting, especially with what we've seen from some other companies from uh, last year. Now, if you look at Nintendo's uh, Switch system compared to other platforms, the PlayStation 4 is just over 117 million. Uh, based on Nintendo's projection overall, where they expect the Switch to be by the end of this fiscal year, which it would be at the end of March, 2023, the Switch should be passing the PS4 this holiday and probably even passing the Game Boy, which is sitting at 118 million, which means, I mean, next up for the Switch would be the DS and the PS2. Now I do wanna quickly pop over to their best selling list, which has Mario Kart 8 Deluxe at the top at 46.82 million units. I mean, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is on a crash course with 50 million units here pretty pretty soon. I, I think just in this last last quarter, it was like one and a half million more copies that it sold. So you get the Christmas time, it's gonna it's gonna have a nice jump there too. So I'm kind of looking for Mario Kart 8 Deluxe to probably hit that 50 million unit mark by the end of this year. Animal Crossing at 39.38, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate 28.82, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 27.14, Pokemon Sword and Shield 24. 4.5, Mario Odyssey 23.93, Super Mario Party at 18.06, Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl 14.79, Let's Go Pikachu Eevee 14.66, and Ring Fit Adventure 14.54 million, which is pretty impressive for that title, but also consider this, that's the last game on this list of titles from Nintendo, right? You have to sell 14 and a half million copies minimum to make it onto this top sellers list, which is absolutely ridiculous when it comes to first party sales. Now we also had some interesting data that was posted up by Nintendo when it comes to this most recent quarter. That includes Switch Sports at 4.84 million units. That's pretty good overall, I would say for, uh, for that game, but it makes sense considering people are looking at it kind of like that Wii Sports sequel almost, right? On this newer generation of of system from Nintendo. Mario Strikers Battle League at 1.91 million units. I believe that's the best launch we've seen for a Mario sports title from Nintendo. I kind of expected Mario Strikers Battle League to get out of the gate pretty quick. I'll be curious to see how it continues along and if it's able to catch something like a like Mario Tennis Aces that I believe is like in that three and a half to four million range. I, I think they need a lot of work to be done to Mario Strikers to continue sales at, at this pace. And there's Mario Kart 8 Deluxe 1.48, but I'd say the standout is Kirby and the Forgotten Land, another 1.88 million units. In fact, the interesting thing about Kirby is this looks like it's gonna become the best selling game in the entire franchise. The one that it has to catch is Kirby's Dream Land. That's at 5.13 million. Kirby's in the, Kirby in the Forgotten Land is now at 4.53 million units. It should pass uh, Kirby's Dream Land to become the best selling game in the franchise, probably by the end of this current quarter. Oh, and one more thing to point out. We've talked about the all digital era. Well. Take a look at this. This is uh, this is over on their digital sales page. Yeah, digital sales have overtaken physical sales 
on the Nintendo Switch. And uh, this is the highest it's been in quite some time. I mean, 53% is what they have it marked off on here. In fact, digital sales in general for Nintendo from the previous year is up 16%. Percent. I know I joke about the idea of an all digital switch, but I, if it continues to rise like this, where people are buying stuff more on the eShop than they are going in a store and buying it off of the shelf, you never know. Although I do think we have to see this number continue to rise, especially through the holiday season that's coming up here, because you'd expect people to be buying games as gifts and all this, and they'd be buying it physically at retail, but if this digital number continues to move upwards even through the holiday season and we get that information in like the first month or two of 2023, then who knows where Nintendo is going to take this thing. Maybe they would lean more into the all digital era and look to do a digital switch to see what happens. But overall, not like a great quarter for Nintendo. Obviously they're down from last year, but it could have been a lot worse. So overall looking at this, it's mostly about the switch continuing to trek along towards that DS and that PS2 number. And I, I believe it's gonna get there. It'll probably just take another two years. And a lot of this is gonna come down to how Nintendo treats the back half of the Switch's life? Are they gonna to look to extend it with a revision or are they really gonna do a clean break and go to a new Nintendo Switch in say 2024? I guess we'll see, but until then, look out for it to probably pass the PS4 and the Game Boy later on this holiday. Next up, let's talk about an interesting feature that was spotted for the PlayStation 5 DualSense controller. This is by way of patent, which patents are interesting because they don't always end up being used. They're kind of just thrown out there sometimes to more or less lay claim to an idea that's generally pretty specific, but it can at least give us a ballpark as to a direction that one of these companies might take something like their controller with the DualSense. We can see this posted up. This is over on Metro who spotted this and we can see this image here, figure 4D. And you might be wondering what exactly is this? Well. It's the DualSense controller's analog sticks, right? So think about how you would press down on R3 or L3 to click in, maybe to zoom in when you're aiming down a sight or something there, right? Just a little further, maybe to have your focus meter kick in there so you can slow down time or anything there, right? Well, this would be for the DualSense using non-Newtonian fluids to create hydraulic resistance in the analog stick, as in it's harder? to press down. See, normally I think of like pressing down on the analog stick and it just kind of clicks. But I, I guess in this case, there will be some travel to it that could be easier or more difficult to press down depending on what's happening in your game. And I do like seeing kind of the creativity around the immersion and trying to take it to the next level. I just haven't really considered a change in difficulty when pressing in either stick. Although I'm sure developers could come up with different reasons for that to happen. Originally when I saw this, I was like, wait, does that mean that like the tension could change when you're moving the analog sticks around? But this just appears to be more about the pressure and the travel for L3 and R3 when you're pressing down. I'm looking at this though. I don't necessarily think this is a feature that Sony would implement halfway into, into a generation or anything like that, right? Some were wondering if this could be for a pro controller for the DualSense. And we've heard rumors around that, but I don't necessarily think they would introduce a new feature like this hydraulic press for, uh, for your analog sticks because then developers have to create wondering if you have this very expensive controller or something, and most of them would probably just kind of bypass it. But I don't mind it for something that maybe they're working on for the PlayStation 6, because as we've talked about many, many times, these companies are always working on what's next, and that includes for the system and even the controller that would come with it. But let me know what you think about the idea of L3 and R3 are just pressing down the analog stick on your favorite controller, having, I guess, degrees of difficulty and pressure. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about that Pokemon Presents that aired yesterday. It was just about 20 minutes. I was a little disappointed on one hand because there wasn't anything really big or new to announce here in terms of a spinoff. But on the other hand, we got a pretty good look at Scarlet and Violet with some things that I genuinely wasn't expecting, but just for the sake of being somewhat thorough, we'll go through everything that was announced there. Starting with uh, Play Pokemon. 
It's an upcoming uh, event in London in which players compete in the Pokemon video games, a trading card game, Pokemon Go, and Pokemon Unite. There's even a pop-up shop that's planned, so there we go. Ultra Beasts will be coming to Pokemon Go Fest finale. That's on August 22nd. You can see all the recently released Ultra Beasts like Buzzwool, Shaman, and much, much more. There's uh, some new Pokemon and events coming to Pokemon Unite. Then we have Pokemon Masters three-year anniversary, and look at that, Mewtwo's coming to Pokemon Cafe Remix. But they did eventually get to Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, which is basically the reason everyone tuned in for this, to see more information about that open world and, and uh, different Pokemon forms and everything. And they start off talking about the Paldea region as well as the legendary Pokemon, which are given to you at the beginning of the game. And uh, they act as your transportation, as in, you actually ride them around. They have wheels and and everything. They can fly around, they can cruise through the water. I've joked about Pokemon being furniture and now they're just basically, uh, basically automobiles and cars. So there you go. Uh, the open world can be explored how you want. The levels though don't seem to scale, which is a little interesting. If you go through the website, it does mention this. So I, I guess there'd be a more difficult route and an easier route. Back in the day, you would just pick a certain type of Pokemon that would be strong against like the first two gyms, like Bulbasaur, for example, and like a red and blue. Uh, in this case though, there's probably gonna be a weaker gym that you start with and then you kind of work your way up or you can try for one of the intermediate gyms or anything like that. There are three storylines. One of them will focus on the eight Pokemon gyms. So you will have, I guess, just traditional gyms you go around to. And the other two storylines, kind of still a mystery, but if you think about it, in these different Pokemon games, there are like storylines that intertwine with your main objective, which is to seek out different badges. You'll have different factions and stuff get involved. They have to kind of take down anyway. So it almost sounds like they're kind of separating them out a bit. And then you can seek out that story if you want, or you can just completely run through all the different gyms and Victory Road and all that, right? They just show off new forms like the Paldean Whooper. And they also talked about this Terrastal phenomenon, which makes your Pokemon shiny, kind of like gems, and it makes them stronger, can even change their types. They showed Pikachu changing into like a flying type. Now, there were a lot of opinions around the presentation and the graphics, and at this point with Game Freak, I think most of us have accepted that they're not gonna put out like this visually stunning game. For me, as long as the graphics don't get in the way, that's just like, all right, well, Game Freak's at least trying, right? And in this case, it's an open world Pokemon game, something they've never attempted. So, hey, yeah, the landscapes, for the most part, are just gonna be flat textured, like they have been in the other titles, and that's kind of that. I, I guess it looks better than some of their previous games, although that's a low bar as it is, but hey, I think the visuals for where we are with Game Freak is, uh, it's, it's about right. Uh, but the idea of an open world Pokemon game, I'll admit, is intriguing just because it's something new from Game Freak. The levels not scaling is interesting. I'll have to see how this works out and, uh, if it's something that people just end up breaking, um, day one. But for the most part, I like what I'm seeing with Scarlet and Violet. I wasn't expecting to get the legendaries immediately in the game. So maybe there's even like an, an, like an even bigger legendary that's hiding at the end because they're still kind of quiet on the other storylines and who knows, maybe they're optional. And if you maybe seek them out, you get some really strong Pokemon at the end or something. But there we go. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet coming out actually in about three months or so now. So we're getting close. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday, where I ask, how do you feel about the open world approach for the new Pokemon games on Switch? 87% said I like it. Going through the game in any order is interesting. And then 13% said I don't like it. I prefer the more linear path from previous ones. And again, it's gonna come down to how it's handled and we'll find out about that when it comes out. But this could be, a big breakout moment for Game Freak, right? I mean, they kind of started it with Legends Arceus when that released earlier in the year and it felt like a completely new experience. And now they're kind of leaning into the idea of that open world with the more traditional releases. So it's gonna come down to execution at this point because 
a lot of people seem now sold on the idea of an open world Pokemon game. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Roberto saying, I'm against anything to do with cloud or streaming as a huge physical media collector. I just hope companies understand not everyone is on board with the digital age today and that having a physical versions of the product in your collection is way better than streaming or cloud versions of them, which is bad if the internet were to go down or they decided to remove from the digital store. Plus not to mention the video quality on disc is superior versus streaming cloud version. Look, I, I hear you. I prefer to have my games physically in my collection, on my shelf, but I also understand kind of the way the world is shifting right now, especially when it comes to entertainment and games. And most of the time, I'm here to be the cold water that gets thrown on the whole thing and is like, hey guys, I'm gonna tell you, Sony's like 80% digital in the most recent like financial report. Nintendo's now over that 50% mark and Digital just outright benefits these companies more than having to go through all the logistics of shipping and getting these physical copies out for the They just make more money on digital and they have more control. So in that sense, I understand why they are pushing towards digital, even if I and many of you don't like it. I'm just here to prepare you guys for that inevitable future as we get closer and closer to it. So we don't all just look around and go, what happened when we get there? And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here. Today was Nintendo's financial report, those Switch sales. Do you think the Switch is going to catch the PS2 and the DS? And how many more years do you think it'll take? And then also, what about that DualSense controller patent with the, the analog sticks having like pressure that can be changed when you press down? And then also, what about the Pokemon Presents for Scarlet and Violet? Are you excited around the idea of an open world Pokemon game? Thanks guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.